<laughs> She's on her way. On her way, all right. You know, I was showing everybody the picture of, of Mitterrand at the summit. And you know that the royals in Europe always stand exactly like Blair's did, with a hand in the pocket like this. If you look at Mountbatten, oh, Philip yes. and Charles, and yes. Mitterrand in every picture, pocket, always yes. has his hand in the pocket. Uh, well, maybe and it absolutely so. sets him apart. Yeah. Yeah. Incidentally, we had a little move, movement here, something, if you had heard. That over there, instead of the eagle. Well, I didn't think of this, but the photographers were going crazy. And finally, they brought me a couple of pictures. One was of the wearing that as a hat, sitting in a chair. Oh. Right. And then they brought one of one of the heads of an African state. And it looked like he had feathers. <laughs> 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 Looks like that hair so, piece on the show the other night. But that over there, you spoke of my memory. All of that, the 101st Airborne, made that. Have you looked at that, And those are all the leaders on the beaches at Normandy. The war there, both the Allied and Germans, one side are all the Allied, the other side are the Germans. Ha, ha, ha. 
Mrs. Reagan, Mike, family, glad you're here. Uh, I'm Barry Serafin with ABC News, and I, I guess I'm here because, uh, with a few notable exceptions, I probably have known Mike longer than anybody in the press corps. Ten years, I figured. Uh, I have to say that this is probably an occasion for testimonials, but Mike has been a major disappointment to me on a couple of scores. He's never been able to pronounce the name of my hometown in Oregon for ten years, and he's never developed into a, a real news leaker. Uh, so, he's pretty much a washout on that score. <laughs> uh, but also in those 10 years, uh, Mike, I can't remember a single time when he has misled me on anything, and that's a rare thing in politics and government in view of the adversarial roles we're supposed to have. In those roles and in our relationship outside of them, it's always been a pleasure. and. Uh, I know, Mike, you're going to have some adjustments to make in leaving the White House. You're going to be losing some perks, among other things, car and driver and all those. So to help you with your re-entry into the real world, I've, I've brought with me a complete map and all the schedules for the Metro bus here in Washington. <laughs> so, <laughs> so good luck, Mike. And uh, a few words now from uh, a colleague of yours, Jim Baker. Thank you very much, Barry. If you, uh, if you don't think Mike Deaver developed into a reasonably good leaker, you believe in the tooth fairy. <laughs> but that really what I, that's not really what I intended to say up here. I, I'm delighted to have an opportunity to uh, say goodbye to the vicar of visuals. I really didn't think this day would ever come, but I, uh, I really have a piece of advice for you, Mike, as you leave, and that is that you're going to find it's People are really not quite as ready to lose to you in tennis when you're out there in the private sector as they, as they are when you're Deputy Chief of Staff of the White House. But I do want to say a couple of things seriously, and one is that I knew Mike when. I knew Mike in the political arena in 1976 when we were opponents and I won. And I knew him again in the political arena in 1980 when we were opponents and he won. And I knew him in between in 1979 when he was on the outside looking in. And I got to say, in all those cases, he handled himself with competence, with good grace, and totally without any trace of arrogance. Through all of this, when I was on the other side, Mike was not only a strong competitor, he was a political professional as well. And he's one that believes, as I do, that you can be political enemies or political adversaries without being political enemies. And more importantly now, I think I know Mike as a true friend. Most of you here know, and some uh, a lot better than I, of the invaluable contribution which he's made not only to the President and Nancy, but to each and every one of us. 
He has faithfully served not only the President, but our system of government, and I think the American public as well. In no small part, the success of Ronald Reagan's first term is due to Mike Deaver's efforts. And we all know that that success was overwhelmingly endorsed by the American people last November. So I have no doubt, Mike, that you're going to be successful in your next endeavor, and I wish you the very best of luck. Just remember, don't call us, we'll call you. It, uh, in 100 days, I've had to learn uh, all that that guy has done in 20 years or more with the Reagans. I learned to absorb it quickly and then try to replace it. I find, Mike, that's the most tremendous task and something I shall never be able to do, literally. Uh, but I do want to say a few things, Mike, uh, that I have found in that 100 days. Your footprints all around the White House in some very strange areas. And I, th <clears throat> I think that as time goes on, I'm going to have to be calling you, in spite of uh, uh, Jim Baker's advice, I'm going to have to be calling you to find out just where do these footprints lead, because they're in some very curious areas. And there are two areas that I have not been able to find a replacement for you, Mike, in any way, shape, or fashion. I have searched diligently. The first is in the, as a piano player. I have been able, unable to find an aid that could to play with the National Symphony. And the second is in wine testing. You didn't train anyone in your, as a replacement in that. And most of the people here think that Thunderbird is really quite a wine. And, <laughs> and uh, so we're going to need uh, your help on and off as time comes along. Sincerely, I do believe that uh, Mike Diva uh, has, in 100 days, tried his damnedest to educate me, and I appreciate that. And I want you to know, Mike, that from the expressions of all of your subordinates who are staying here behind you, Every one of them has expressed the greatest loyalty to you and are now trying to transfer it. And it, it shows the caliber of the people you have had with you. It shows your own uh, style and your own integrity that you were able to inculcate this into these people. Mike, we're really going to miss you here, and good luck to you. And now as we depart the stage, uh, we'll allow the boss, Nancy, if you will, would you please come forward. This is really a tough moment, not only because of the nature of the occasion, but because I am under strict orders from the guest of honor that I'm not to do anything that produces a golf ball or a tennis ball in your throat or our throats. And uh, staying away from that kind of talk with regard to what this occasion is all about handicapped me. Then I thought, in view of recent happenings, that. Maybe I could say a few words in German. <laughs> and uh, the only thing I knew was Haben Sie ein Streichholz, if you got a match, and that wouldn't work. Dankeschön comes in kind of handy. An awful lot of Dankeschens. So I really am going to try and stay away from that lump in the throat kind of talk. I know this. You're all gathered here, and I prefer to think of it as that the only change that's occurring is uh, physical location. That uh, he will not be in an office in the West Wing, he'll be in an office just a few blocks from here. I mean, it makes it a little inconvenient, it might take a few moments longer to get together, but um, he's still on hand. And I'm going to keep on thinking about it that way. Because uh, he may change the physical location of the desks. He may not be as close at hand as he's been. But there's one thing that won't change at all, and that is a friendship that's been built on almost 20 years of very close association. And uh, if it's true that the guy that holds this job is the most powerful man in the world, then I got news for you, Mike. I ain't letting go. 
friends will remain. And I, um, I wish I could think of, of something other to say, but if I did, I would risk getting into that territory that you've said Stop. you and I might. <laughs> he, he just said it. Stop. But it's, he really has been that long and that close in all the years in Sacramento and then in between when I was out on the mashed potato circuit and he was running that and uh, now in these years here in the White House. The only thing I can't explain is how did you get paroled ahead of me? I figured that we'd they'd probably open the gates on the same day for both of us and, and my behavior's been just as good as yours. But anyway, paroled you are, but while you're on parole, I'm your parole officer, so don't get too far away. All right. This is a very bittersweet moment for all of us. But Barry, it's Rosebud. No. Okay. Rose Bush? No. I'll get it down one of these days. And Jim, I think that's probably one of the best speeches Margaret Tutwiler ever wrote. <laughs> and Don, the reason that I haven't given up the secrets about the wine tasting and the piano playing is that I'm going to reveal that I couldn't ever play the piano unless I had a bottle of wine. <laughs> Mr. President, I, when, uh, Don Regan insisted that we have this party today, which I knew was going to be very difficult for me. I said I wanted to have a lot of people here who don't come to receptions in the Rose Garden, the telephone operators, the White House communications people, the messengers, some of my friends from the press, but the people who really, the security people, the drivers, the secretaries, the correspondence units, the usher's office, all those people who make this White House work, whether you're here or whether I'm here. And I want to say thank you to you today. Um, we have already had our private thank yous and goodbyes and reminiscences, but I'm going to repeat a story that some of you have heard before, but today I'm going to give you an answer to it. And that is four and a half years ago when we all came back here, Blair and Amanda flew back on an airplane by themselves. And uh, we picked them up at National Airport in our car with our driver. I mean, that was really something. And Bear was about uh, four and a half years old. And we went around the monuments at night. And then we got home to our new house and into our new bedrooms and finally about 11 o'clock tucked into bed, and Blair looked up at me and he said, Dad, is Washington part of Earth? <laughs> and I said, I don't know. But today I can tell you, Bear, it's not only part of Earth, it's the best damn capital in this world. <laughs> and in large part, Bear, it's because of these two people here who've made it stronger and safer and better for all of us and for all of you. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Nancy.